In this video, we'll cover iterative methods for solving systems of linear equations. Both of the methods that we'll talk about start with an initial guess for a solution vector x, and then iterate via some method to achieve convergence to a solution within a desired tolerance. In contrast to the direct methods we studied in previous videos, when using the iterative methods, the total number of operations required to reach convergence is not known in advance. We'll use quantities called vector norms that are scalar measures of the magnitude of a vector. The vector norms will be used to analyze the convergence. Here we'll introduce three common vector norms. We'll also introduce their analogs that can be comp computed for matrices. The L1 norm of a vector is the sum of the absolute values of the elements of the vector. The L infinity norm is the maximum of the absolute values of the elements of the vector. And the L2 norm is the root sum of squares of the elements of the vector. The analogous matrix norms have similar definitions. The 1 norm for a matrix is also called the column sum norm. It's the maximum of the sum of the absolute values of any particular column. The column with the maximum sum of absolute values is taken to give the column sum norm. The infinity norm for a matrix is also known as the row sum norm. It's defined as the maximum of the sum over the absolute values of the elements in the rows. So the row with the largest sum of absolute values is taken to find the infinity norm. And finally, the two norm which for a matrix is also called the Euclidean norm, is found the same way as the two norm for a vector. It's the root sum of squares of the absolute values of all of the elements in the matrix. For vector norms and matrix norms, any of the norms is always greater than or equal to zero. And the norm can only be equal to zero when all of the elements of the vector or the matrix are also equal to zero. The norm of a constant multiplied by any vector or a constant multiplied by any matrix is the same as the product of the absolute values of the constant and the norm in question. For any of the norm definitions that we've looked at, the norm of the sum of two vectors is always less than or equal to the sum of the norms. That's also true for matrix norms. For matrix norms, there's an additional property that's important, which is that the norm of a product of two matrices is always less than or equal to the product of the norms. The compatibility relations tell us something about the relationships between matrix and vector products and their norms. This relationship holds for the one norm, the infinity norm, and the two norm. The norm of the product is always less than or equal to the product of the norms. We'll invoke this compatibility relation later on. Vector and matrix norms and these important properties will be used for, among other things, calculating the convergence of the iterative methods that we're going to develop here. For a general iterative method for solving a linear system of equations, we take the coefficient matrix A and we split it into two parts so that A is equal to a matrix Q minus a matrix P, where Q must be non-singular. Remember that a non-singular matrix is one that has a non-zero determinant. A non-singular matrix also has an inverse. Then we rewrite the problem ax equals b, where x is our unknown vector, replacing a with q minus p, and that allows us to bring the p component to the other side. Then we can write a recurrence relationship, whereby we start with an initial guess for the solution vector x, and we use this expression to compute the subsequent guess for x. The superscripts in parentheses here indicate the iteration number. So when k is 0, we have our initial guess for the solution vector. When k is 1, we have our second guess for the solution vector. When k is 2, our third guess, and so forth. Because q is non-singular, we can solve this equation for the kth iteration by multiplying both sides by the inverse of q. In many ways, this is analogous to using the fixed point method for solving nonlinear equations, which we developed in the previous chapter. We make a guess for the solution, and we use a recurrence relation to compute successive guesses. 
The trick for the two iterative methods that we'll develop here is to select how to decompose A into Q and P. Before discussing how to do that, we'll first talk about convergence. A method converges when the error, that is the difference between our current guess and the actual solution value, gets smaller as we increase the number of iterations. The error vector at the kth iteration is the kth iteration of x minus the true solution x. Since by definition q minus p times x is equal to b, we can substitute q minus p times x in for b in the iteration method. Then grouping the q and p terms, we use the definition of the error. x at k plus 1 minus x is the error of the k plus 1th iteration, and x at k minus x is the error at the kth iteration. So our q and p matrices provide us with a relationship between the error at successive iterations. If the inverse of q times p is defined as the matrix M, then multiplying M raised to the kth power by our initial error gives us the error at the kth iteration. If the error at the kth iteration is smaller than our initial error, then we can expect that the method will converge. Remember that the matrix and vector norms are scalar values, so we can compress this matrix vector equation to an equation involving just scalars by using the compatibility relation and, in this case, the infinity norm. The infinity norm of the error at the kth iteration is equal to the infinity norm of our matrix M multiplied by the error at the initial iteration. By the compatibility relation, this should always be less than or equal to the product of the norms. The method will converge when the infinity norm of M or the infinity norm of inverse of q times p is less than 1. So in order for our method to converge, we must choose a q that's non-singular and choose q and p such that the infinity norm of inverse q times p will be less than 1. One way of doing that is to use the Jacobi method. The Jacobi method begins with decomposing the coefficient matrix A into a diagonal, an L, and a U matrix. The diagonal matrix contains only non-zero elements on the diagonal. The U matrix is upper triangular with zero elements on the diagonal, and the L matrix is lower triangular with zero elements on the diagonal. So the sum of D, U, and L is the original matrix A. Then we define Q as the diagonal matrix and minus the sum of L and U as the matrix P. To implement the Jacobi method, we'll use our general iteration formula to solve AX equals B, where the inverse of D is the inverse of Q and minus L plus U is P. Note that this requires that the diagonal elements of the matrix A be non-zero to ensure that the matrix D, which contains those diagonal elements, has an inverse or is non-singular. From this equation, we can compute the individual elements of X directly. The recurrence formula for the individual elements of X looks like this, where the reciprocal of AII is the inverse of the D matrix, and the off-diagonal elements, AIJ, are represented by the matrices L and U here. Remember, this method is guaranteed to converge if the infinity norm of the matrix M is less than 1. That will always occur when A is a diagonally dominant matrix. A diagonally dominant matrix is one for which the absolute values of the diagonal elements are larger than the sums of the absolute values of all of the other elements in each row in which that diagonal element appears. Diagonally dominant matrices are very common when solving boundary value problems, which we'll encounter later in the semester. The Gauss-Seidel method is a modification of the Jacobi method. It decomposes A slightly differently. In the Gauss-Seidel method, D and L are combined to give us Q, and the P matrix is taken from minus U, or the elements above the diagonal. Again, we can use our general iteration formula with our new definition of Q and P, and Again, it's straightforward to write the recurrence relationship for each of the elements x sub i. Notice here that we can use, notice if we compute the x sub i elements in order, 
then we can use some of those k plus one-th iteration elements of x to find other values of the k plus one-th iteration. We'll say more about this later on. This method is also guaranteed to converge when the infinity norm of m is less than one. For the Gauss-Seidel method, m is computed from the inverse of d plus l multiplied by minus u. Because it's derived from a modification of the Jacobi method, the Gauss-Seidel method will always converge if the Jacobi method also converges. The Gauss-Seidel method also works well when A is symmetric and positive definite. Let's take a closer look at the recurrence formulas for the Jacobi and for the Gauss-Seidel methods so we can compare them. In the Jacobi method, we calculate the k plus one-th element of the solution vector using all of the values in the kth guess for the solution vector. However, in the Gauss-Seidel method, we only need to use the kth guess of the solution vector for the values of x sub i that are greater than i. And for the values of x sub i that are less than i, we can use the more recent updated guess of the solution vector. Since the solution vector guess at the k plus, plus one-th iteration is a better approximation of the solution at the kth iteration, the Gauss-Seidel method may converge faster, especially for large systems. Therefore, the Gauss-Seidel method is an improvement of the Jacobi method. The Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel methods both require approximately n squared multiplications per iteration. In order to reach convergence, we need to multiply those n squared multiplications times m numbers of iterations that are required. While we don't know how many iterations will be required from the beginning, we can still compare this to the LU factorization methods, which we said earlier require approximately one-third n cubed operations for large matrices, where n is the number of rows and number of columns in the coefficient matrix. Therefore, we can expect the iterative indirect methods to be faster when n squared m is less than one-third n cubed that is, the number of iterations required for convergence is less than a third of the size of the coefficient matrix. If we have a 100 by 100 coefficient matrix and we can reach convergence in fewer than 33 iterations, then the indirect method will be faster than the direct method. For sparse matrices, with only p non-zero entries per row, the iterative methods require even fewer multiplications, and they're faster when p times n times m is less than one-third n cubed. That's a tongue twister. Or that is, when the number of iterations is less than one over three p times n squared. In the next video, we'll talk about a situation called ill conditioning, which we should be able to identify, because it will make it difficult for us to find solutions to systems of linear equations.